Let's go ahead and get started. So today's class has to do with um, Visioneering, the book Visioneering by um, Andy Stanley. And we had chapters one through four. Um, if you check the Google Plus page, we also have, um, I also posted all of the projects um, on a Google Doc from chapters one through four. I uh, don't know how uh, you all read and process that. Um, Clint, it sounds like you're swimming to catch up to Eric on the uh, channel island. On the channel island? Yeah, well, it sounds like you're, you're swimming. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> no <worries. laughs> Um, so let's talk about uh, the different chapters that we ran across in Visioneering. So let's start with um, start with you, Yuran. Um, talk to us about introduction, chapter one, um, some of your takeaways. Um, here we go. Okay. Uh, yeah. So chapter one, um, there, there was you know the two. Um, Two points, a vision begins as a concern. Um, and the second one was a uh, vision does not necessarily require immediate action. Um, that one really um, kind of spoke to me. Uh, I've I gone through this often, I feel like, where something happens or, or I'm really interested in it and, and I just want to jump right in and start doing stuff because I'm by nature more of the administrative type and the planner and, you know, get, get things going. Um, like a good example of that was um, uh, last year. I don't know if you guys have heard of uh, A21. They do the human trafficking and sex um, trafficking, that kind of stuff. Um, and they do like a yearly kind of walk, you know, like all around the world. They have these walks for it, you know. And, it, it, and for me, it did, you know, it started as a concern. Like this is something I wasn't really aware of and kind of got brought to my attention. And my wife, um, it's been on her heart for quite a long time. So anyways, so this opportunity came, hey, why don't we organize some churches in the valley and let's put on a walk and let's just, you know, go ahead and just, just do this. And I, it was one of those things where it just was in my mind constantly, like, who, who, where, when we get people there, where do we stage them? And, you know, <laughs> so in my mind, I've already kind of planned it all. Um, but in the end, um, it didn't really, I think it was one of the, it was one of these things I feel like was, it wasn't the right time. Um, like in my head, I already had it all planned out, but um, and it, it would have been easy to do it, like within our church and a couple of na neighboring churches. But uh, uh, I don't know. It, it kind of for me, it, it, I don't know. It's just it didn't. It, things didn't start lining up the way I thought it would, and just eventually um, we decided to pass on it, so we, we didn't do it. But um, it, the the concern it's still definitely there, and I think you know my wife is actually moving in the direction of getting schooling and training and that kind of stuff. So kind of waiting actually now and see how that whole thing um, unfolds in our lives and how we get involved. Um, yeah, and I, I think I, I love that uh, example of the Empire Strikes Back. That, you know, I think we, we I, you know, I feel like Luke often where, you know, I don't need to complete this stuff, I'm just gonna go do it. And, <laughs> right. And so, yeah. Right, so that, that's, um, that's in the movies, right? So yeah, I thought that was a good example too. It's like you know, in the movies we just kind of throw away all all of the reality, and uh, the project just moves along. Right. That's a great starting point as well for visions that it begins with a concern, becomes a moral imperative, um, and yet sometimes we have to to kind of wait for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some good things that came out of them. All right. Um, anything else you want to add? Uh. No, that's, that's what I had for chapter one. All right, Greg, why don't you talk to us about um, uh, what you took either from the introduction or chapter one. Okay, uh, well, what was really good was that uh, here, uh, Iran talked about that all. As the vision comes forth, um, you have to look at it, and I understood what 
he was saying there's a lot of good ideas out there, but how many of them are God ideas? And out of vision one, he goes into that. And man, it was speaking a lot because I think a lot of us get a lot of good ideas. And if it's divine, it's going to be coming from God. And so he says, uh, allow that vision to mature in us. And the biggest thing is, he says, is uh, it's visionarying is a process. And um, he went into that a lot of prayer time going into it. And that was that was good part. This uh, time elapsed. And um, as we see things happening and going through, the we mature in our preparation for the vision while we're waiting and praying. And if it is from God, he's in control. He's going to take care of it. In this whole process, I saw out of chapter one there that um, uh, when your end was saying you got to wait, um, was I got out of the waiting part that God is putting all the pieces together behind the scenes we don't even have a clue about. And I thought, wow, this is this is really um, good. Uh, that's the and it was just probably the smallest section in this. Uh, this first chapter of that God's doing everything behind the scenes. And if it is a, um, a vision from God, uh, then everything will be in line and it'll be in line with um, his, what he's doing in the world. And it'll just kind of unfold for you. Um, and I saw it happening as a couple of things the, the Lord had told me about at the church and um, it was kind of neat because I'd ask some people to start looking into certain areas. And uh, that was uh, exciting because it hasn't been given to go, but they're preparing and they're planning and there's a lot of prayer going on it. So I was, as I was reading this, I go, wow, Lord, uh, this is right on to what we're doing in getting ready and everything. So for me, that's uh, chapter one was... Uh, Probably like uh, waiting time, but really that waiting time, because sometimes we do want to jump the gun. When I read and I read over and over that little short section on God preparing behind the scenes, that's what struck me. Chapter one, so much. Hi, Paul. Hey, Paul. Glad you made it. Sorry for the late notice. We're glad you're able to join. Can you hear me? <laughs> Maybe not. He just looks like he's mad. Well, let me, let me see if I can. Uh... All right, so um, I keep, uh, I'm going to get uh, Clint. I keep uh, muting and unmuting you. <laughs> I thought it was personal. No. Uh, you're able to hear, though, right, when I mute you? Yes. Okay. Good. So in that first chapter also, he talked about uh, vision weaves four things according to the fabric of our daily existence. All right, so anybody want to take a stab and talk a little bit about what those four things are? From the, the building blocks or the... Uh... No, the, the before that, it's in the introduction. Oh, got it, introduction. All the passion, motivation, direction, and uh, purpose. Right, right. Can you well, yeah, no, I, I can I can appreciate the passion for sure. So, yeah, the, um, let's see. So, can yeah, as far as that, you know. yeah, let me talk. Paul, we can't hear you. Can you hear us? Okay, I was just checking. I'm sorry. All right, good. All right, Clint, go ahead. 
Yeah, I mean, I think when you kind of listen and out to those four building blocks, the passion, motivation, and then the direction and the purpose, I mean, I thought it was good. I, mean, it, it, I think he kind of lays it out what we think in our own heads of how we're going to propose and how we, we try to daydream and what does daydream mean and then, and then putting it to, on paper and then, you know, what motivates us and what's got half for us. Um, but I, I think I was, I, what stuck to me in most of that was maybe that's just where I'm at just on the direction on number three, like maybe the most practical advantage of vision is, is it sets a direction for our lives. And so I was just kind of think of that. And the next thing was just the roadmap. I was like, okay, what roadmap have I put a port, put down for me? What have I put down on, on paper and where am I going? Um, I just, I, I try to think of just everything from business to, to ministry to, to family and just, uh, and so I thought it was really practical, at least for, for me and my wife, just as, on the different steps we've taken from being married to having kids, to schools, to, to purchases, to homes, to, um, to doing business. I, I, I enjoyed it. I mean, I didn't think it was anything that's revolutionary, but it was just like, it was just good that he was able to kind of lay it out. And I, so I really appreciated that part of opening it up to me. And then just taking it like, what, what is my purpose? And then kind of directing that purpose back to what God would have for us for our lives um, and figuring out that what it is and, and how best we can honor God, how we can honor God, you know, through that vision that he's placed in our hearts. And, and so, and I think that's, you know, that evokes that emotion. You're like going, okay, this is good. You know, and then when you start getting passionate about it, it's real easy to see when people are passionate about it. So I'm trying to think about my, my passions as well as those that are close to me. When I see their, their voice raise or their, or their eyebrows, you know, go and they're like, yeah, this is, this is, this is amazing. You know, when you see a, a guy that's brand new in love with his, his girlfriend wants to propose to her and you can see the passion in his eyes and his voice and the inflections. Um, so all that, I just started taking all these notes and, you know, knowing that we are his workmanship and he just kind of goes on from Ephesians 2 and, and, and trying to encourage us like we're, you know, created in Christ, you know, for good works and, and to take that vision and, and passion and put it together and, and, and just the partnership, I think, that God creates in us to, to work with him and for him. Um, and that it's not, he's just not doing all the stuff. He's just asking us to join him in what he has going for us. And as soon as we realize it, it's just how beautiful it can be. So, you know, I kind of went all over the place there, but I, I, I enjoyed that. And I think and it's just a good, you know, good, good nuts and bolts kind of stuff that he puts down here. So I enjoyed the book. So, yeah. No, I, I appreciate your comments, especially because uh, one of the things that I was going to challenge all of us with is connecting some dots back all the way to our, the first book we read and the whole cycle of leadership. So you talk about personal leadership I have to master myself. There's the, the relational leadership or one-on-one -on -one leadership. And we talked about maybe that being a marriage or other relationships where I influence people one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, a team relationship, which can be a family or a group or uh, and then an organizational leadership, which can be a position in a church or a pastor in a church, whatever that might be. Um, but at each of yeah. those levels, you have some um, leadership or visionary dynamics that come into play. And I think oftentimes we do vision um, informally, naturally. Just uh, It's just something that kind of forms in us and, and we pursue dreams. And I think what's helpful about a book like this is to put some feet on, on those things, because I think vision really is a catalyst for, for behavior. Uh, it's a catalyst for accomplishment. So when you put these four things together, passion, motivation, direction, and purpose, um, they apply to all those things. Um, if I lose a sense of passion or vision for my marriage as it runs through the stages, then, you know, I, I grow distant and unengaged or disengaged from that, that process. And the same thing is true at every level of your life. So uh, revisiting and re-engaging and reinvigorating, clarifying vision, uh, I find to be a, uh, a high level leadership activity, which is why I um, made us read this whole book. Um, as opposed to you know, the middle book, we, I, I took you through bits and pieces and then you can uh, address which areas are more practical for you. Um, and even though there aren't, all of us aren't senior pastors in this, um, in this class, uh, I think sometimes we, we take the vision part of this and, and, and put, push it off to a more senior place. Whereas I think vision is, uh, important at every level of ministry and every level of an organization to break that down into the different component parts to have a vision for your particular ministry that, that you're involved with. Agreed. So I think that it's a, um, 
an, an important part of, of leadership, but not one that, that often is formalized all the way down the chain of, of participants in, in, in the leadership team. So I think that's an important, um, important uh, yep, agreed. practice. It's been a long weekend. I'm, I've run out of words. <laughs> That's, that's kind of what I'm doing good. right now as I'm running out of words. Um, but one of the uh, one of the quotes from this first chapter that I thought was good was a clear vision along with the courage to follow through dramatically increases your chance of coming to the end of your life. Looking back with a deep abiding satisfaction and thinking I did it. I succeeded. I finished well. My life counted. And uh, I think that's important for all of us, especially uh, uh, those of us who are gaining age uh, and years you kind of you start to ramp up that sense of evaluation of what has been the significance of my life and the more you've clarified vision and put feet to that vision the the, the better off you're going to feel about answering that question so all right thanks clint i'm going to although you're quiet right now so i won't mute you until <laughs> you know, mute me i'm going to keep walking around so go ahead and mute me it's fine <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll just do that unless when you start making noise. Um, okay. All right, Janet, I left you for last last week. I'll give you an earlier slot this week. Um, talk to us about chapter two. Um, maybe some takeaways from chapter two that you had. Okay. Again, chapter two is mostly talking about planning and praying. Um, just again, the time that he spent. Relating back to Nehemiah and kind of how he's took that time to pray and how that's important in terms of vision. Um, what I thought was interesting was that he prayed um, for an opportunity. I think it's um, on page 32. It talks about, it's interesting that Nehemiah never prayed for God to rebuild the wall. What he prays for is an opportunity to go rebuild it himself. That is the difference between a dreamer and a visionary. And then the visionaries look for that opportunity to do something. So I, just, I thought that was interesting because I think sometimes we say we want this to happen, um, but to pray that we can be a part of that, that we have the opportunity to do that. And I think that's, I think it was in chapter one where he talked a little bit about that tension between what is and what could be. And I think that's where that vision comes in. You see something, it's like, oh, I, you know, I want it to be like this, and it's not. And then to pray that I would have the opportunity to be able to, to make that difference. And then he prayed for favor too. I thought that was interesting. I don't think that's what we typically think to to pray for. Um, we pray that we want it done or that kind of thing, but to pray for favor in the process and, and that God would grant him success. I'm getting feedback from Clint. I don't know. How do I mute him on mine or? I muted him. Okay. All right. Sorry, Clint. Um, <laughs> so yeah, just praying for opportunities. And then the other thing I thought was interesting, I think it's actually in the next chapter, but it really spoke to me was probably talk about praying for success, but that success equals faithfulness. So often we change the, equate the rewards of the success to what success is, but he talked about really that, that piece of being faithful. Um, and then the planning, you know, just that he planned, he took time to plan the strategy even before you're there. And I know I feel like I've done this a lot in different places when you start thinking about a ministry or an opportunity, you start, and that's who I am. I, I'm a planner anyway, wow. but you start thinking through, okay, what could this look like? And you, you begin to have those plans, even though, you know, Maybe it's not, the time isn't right yet for it to happen, or um, even when it actually does come to fruition, it looks different than your plans, but at least when, it, when the opportunity arises, you've got some things, you know, already figured out. And I think Andy Stanley was talking a little bit about how when he was planning for his church and started writing up the, you know, the values and what's his church going to be and the mission and how it's going to be structured and all that stuff before he was even, you know, there was any, even any inkling of a church, but when the time came, he had done, he had prepared because he had done that sort of planning and preparation ahead of time. So yeah. that was kind of what I got out of chapter two. I probably like chapter three a little bit better, but, um, <laughs> but again, I think it's just, I think the things I liked was that success equals faithfulness. And also the, the, that idea that so often when you're given a vision or when there's something happening, it's beyond what you can do, you know, and for us, we're only supposed to worry about the, the what God's job is the how, you know, so often we think, Oh, how, what, how am I going to make this happen? But that I think oftentimes, at least in my life, when he's given me something, it's, it's way beyond anything I could accomplish in my own strength or power. And that's how you kind of know it's that God vision. It's like, okay, you're calling me to do this and I want to do it, but I have no idea how I'm going to do it. 
you know, I need you to come through. And, and again, I think that's where we grow the most spiritually. I know for me, as I look back, it's those times when he's called me to sort of step out in faith and make something happen and start a ministry, do something. And then it's like, okay, I'm willing, but I don't know that, are you sure I'm the right person? Are you, you know, I don't know if I'm equipped. I don't know if I have the skills. And then, and then you see it come to fruition. It's like, okay, well, God did that because I couldn't have done that on my own power and ability. And that's where I think your faith grows and you say, oh, okay, if, if God helped me and was faithful through that situation, he'll be faithful in the future when he calls me to do things that are outside my comfort zone or outside what I think I'm capable of doing. Do you have a vision planning process? For me personally? Yeah. Or in our church? Uh, start personally, and then if, you, if you're involved and have one for the church, sir. Sure. I don't know that I would say I have. I mean, I mean, I guess the stuff that we do at the church involves also sort of personal vision, some of that. Um, I don't know that I have a specific, like, sort of life vision kind of thing. I, I think I tend to have more vision for specific, either like a, a ministry or something that God's called me to do. Here's what I would like to see happen in this ministry or at our church. And, and then oftentimes the, I think the pieces come behind that. For me, I think it, it's probably not as formal as it could be. Oftentimes for me, it's just as I'm praying, as I'm reading, as I'm like, just God speaks to me and tells me, you know, there are different things that I feel like, okay, this is God, something that God's calling me to do, or this is that, just that prompting that God puts on my heart that, hey, it could be like this, you know, whether it's something that's just church-wide, and I would say, hey, here's something that kind of God put on my heart. What if we did such and such, or what if, what if this looked like this, or whether it's, you know, something in my specific ministry area I want you know, all of our church should be involved in discipleship and here's what that looks like or, you know, whatever that the case may be. But um, yeah, I don't know if I would call it a formal, like I sit down and draft a vision, but I feel like I have in my head what I want that vision to be mm -hmm. for, for certain things. Again, I think there's sometimes there's sort of that big vision of who am I and what am I trying to accomplish? And then there's vision in terms of specific ministries you know right now we're, we're involved with this rooted discipleship process so we've kind of, kind of thought through what does that look like what is success in in rooted what what happens you know how many people do we want to go through that a lot of the you know what's the end result of that what's my vision for that and i mean that kind of thing so i think um part of the reason i ask is because i think um planning uh and prayer but planning uh, as we get to the nuts and bolts of planning is is directly connected with vision and you know when we talk about what do i what am i going to do today <laughs> what am i going to do this week what am i going to do this month what am i going to do this year uh, those things uh need to be driven by some overarching value oriented space which we would call vision and our tendency is to do the urgent and, and in ministry that's often driven by others so we find ourselves being pushed into certain activities or behaviors scheduling all of that by the demands of other people so at the senior level, that's often uh, the demands of a board, the demands of just the schedule, the demands of funerals and weddings and counseling and, and interruptions that, that interfere with, with what you might set a course to do. I think as a staff person, that might be also driven by all of those things, plus the demands of a supervisor or a boss. And so planning becomes critical, you know, in terms of connecting these dots of, of having a clarity about vision and then implementing that backward all the way back to my daily plan. Yeah, I think as a church, we have been, again, just with having a new leader in, we've been spending a lot of time on, I mean, we've had retreats talking about, okay, vision, yeah. mission, who are we, what are we trying to accomplish at the end of the day, how are we going to get there? So I, I feel like we've done a bit of that big picture stuff and um, and every, actually every week, you know, in our lead team meetings, you know, we kind of go back over those four things that we're trying to accomplish this year and where are we at on them? How are those things happening? So, um, I, I think more now in this season, I'm aware of it than probably perhaps in other seasons. I, I feel like we are pretty much on focus and trying to accomplish some specific things as opposed to, um, other seasons in ministry that I've been around here. Yeah. So let me just kind of talk a little bit about that just personally for me before we move off this planning 
praying and planning thing because I think this is an important personal um, personal discipline. Uh, if I were to write a book on spiritual disciplines, I I, I might include a book on, a, a chapter on planning. <laughs> you know of time management, orienting, orienting, um, my life with, uh, with my vision. You mentioned, uh, the comment that's made, uh, between a vision and a dream, dreamers and visionaries. And sometimes that's a challenge, you know, the vision, uh, component, we want to make it, uh, oriented towards God accomplishing something in our lives. We want it big enough so that we can say God did this, but not yet so big that says, well, there's no potential that I would ever be involved in this because it just doesn't suit me. And I think that, that kind of hits the nail of, of the difference between a dreamer and a visionary is the connection between God's involvement and my giftedness and capacity so that I involve myself in a vision that is actually already ordained by God for me. So when we get into the chapter where he talks about you know, God is in this. It's not just the idea of the vision, the end result of the vision that he's in. It's also in how he's constructed you uh, that defines how you fit in that vision and what that vision is going to be for you. And so I think that connection keeps us from being a dreamer and actually helps us to get back to the visionary where I say, this is how God has constructed me. These are my gifts and my talents. Uh, this is the context in which I function the best. And um, having all of that in mind, what's a godly vision that pushes me past my own human limitations and includes God in that process? And then what am I going to do now to start implementing that vision on a day-to-day -day basis? Sometimes when we read books like this, so I'll throw the, I think, it, I don't remember which chapter it's in, but the story about landing the property. Sometimes when we read stories like that, um, we over project our own skill and the writer under pictures all that he did to make that happen. Um, I don't want to undermine the faith part of the Andy Stanley. We walked into this room, talked to these people and landed a $5 million piece of property. <laughs> you know, that's a God thing, but he left a lot of steps out and a lot of things out that were in his gift mix and the gift mix of the people that were around him that may not necessarily be in Phelan or Nuevo. They might be in Ventura, but they're, they might not be in Phelan or Nuevo. And I, I find that I don't want to, you know, I don't want to short sight my own place and our people, but I also want to be realistic about living in a rural community of 5,000 people and having a church of somewhere between two and 350 and then thinking about um, a million dollar building project um, for, you know, just, just a zone, our, our current property that we purchased. And uh, you start thinking, okay, yeah, there's a prayer element in there, but there's also a skill element in there. Um, a giftedness element in there. So when you start picturing that kind of a vision, you better have people around you that have that level of skill that comes from God um, that are able to pull that off. Otherwise, you know, you become a dreamer. And uh, you know, I'm going to build. Um, I'm going to build Mariner's Church here in Nuevo. That's what. I, that's what my vision is. And I, I'm like, well, you know, that's probably not where I want to go for a number of reasons, but that, that whole thing is important. Um, and then, you know, bringing that back down to your, to your weekly, once you land on a vision that's realistic um, and yet challenging, you want to then begin to, to do that work of planning back to how does this fit into my, my, my plan. So I plan weekly. Um, uh, that's my regular um, kind of chunk. Uh, that I do on a regular basis. I plan quarterly and I do that with kind of a day a day that I escape. And then I plan yearly. And I usually do that with uh, a two or three day personal escape where I do my planning for a year. And in that planning for a year, it may extend beyond that, but it's typically in, in that regard. So um, if you don't have those kinds of um, uh, 
um, calendar items in your in your calendar that I, this this is my time to plan the week. This is my time to plan the quarter. This is my time to plan the year. You're going to be overwhelmed and driven by a lot of other things, and you're not going to be driven by your vision or your purpose. And so you 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 need to kind of integrate those things into the mix. Um, he didn't talk a lot about those kinds of details in the book, but those are the kind of details that that you want to um, accomplish. So I think in visionary project number two, you know, he talks about what changes would you would need to take place. Um, He's talking about other people and their thinking, uh, but I think you need to add um, something to that. Write a simple plan. What can you do now to actually say, what What am I going to do to incorporate regular planning that connects with my vision in my schedule, weekly, quarterly, yearly? What's that going to look like? How am I going to revisit this vision? And then how am I going to actually revisit these steps that I've actually put down to accomplish that vision? If you don't do that, it's going to get away from you. you. You'll just, it'll just disappear. And it's like, oh gosh, I talked about that. Look at this great thing I put together last January, but we did nothing to accomplish it. And that's also part of accomplishing vision that I think is, is in this part. Uh, the more, if I can lean this way, the more humanist part on the, on the planning is that you've got to be invested and committed and has to become part of what you do on a regular basis. I think it was the beauty of the Nehemiah thing where he talked about the planning in there and how Nehemiah just scored it out. Um, but for you, as you think about ministry and your ministry life, I would, I would step back and insert into my calendar this week. When am I going to, when am I going to plan weekly? When am I going to plan quarterly? When am I going to plan yearly or divide it up however you need to? But um, that's how I do it. Actually, I'm preaching to the choir right now because I desperately need to do that myself because my calendars got away from me. So maybe that's where all that's coming from. All right. Thanks, Janet. Um, Jerry, talk to me about uh, chapter three. So positions, please, is the title. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, I just want to say uh, as an overall statement, this guy has hit me dead center. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and it's, and, uh, you know, to me, that's a, that's a God thing. This book is one of the reasons God had me join this class to begin with, because I needed it. Yeah. Um, you know, God gave me a vision and it, the one thing that keeps running through his first four chapters, at least is wait, wait on God. And that's so difficult to do. And, and mine happens to be one of the longer ones. I've been waiting for years. God gave me a vision. And, um, and so there are a lot of things that I know needs to, that, that God is going to have to take care of because I cannot. And I'm aware of that. And so I watch for those things to happen. And there have been a few that have happened that keep me. One of the things he says here. Um, well, I think it was back in chapter two that the too many hours on the starting blocks can cause you to lose sight of your vision. And, um, so I've had to, uh, because it has been years, um, I've had to really stay focused, but it's not that I haven't been busy because one other thing God wants me to do is learn his word. And so most of the last, I became a Christian in August 2007, most of those last eight and a half years has been spent in his word, in the manuscripts, into other religions, see, seeing how things got to the point where they are today from 2,000 years ago, when things were pretty clear, Christ was pretty clear about everything he said, and, and things have been... The, the water's a little muddy out there. Um, First Southern Baptists think Baptists are off the wall. It, you know, we think that um, uh, some of the other religions out there are off the wall. And they are, but how did they get there? And those are some of the things I've been doing over the last several years. 
that is my part and then uh, waiting on God to do his part. I'm nowhere near ready, and I understand that. Um, and so, uh, matter of fact, a couple of years ago, I thought I was ready. I kind of got cocky because I really started. <laughs> I was able to give people answers when they asked questions about the word. I got a little too cocky. So God gave me a dream asking me if I was ready, and I said, yeah, I'm loaded. Let's go. Well, then he had somebody check it out. I was only about a third ready. And that was two years ago, so that was almost seven years into it. So I, you know, Jesus, of course, I mean, he certainly had his vision. He wasn't. He was like 30 before he ever really started. So I don't know how many years it's going to take. I know I'm not ready. But this book is, I mean, you know, in, in the uh, third chapter um, on uh, page 42, he says, uh, Often there's little to go on other than gut level, unquenchable, insatiable desire. And God has given me that. And then the next sentence is hopefully a sense of destiny, a feeling that this is what you were made for, an assurance that God has called you into uncharted waters with a divine purpose in mind. And it says, uh, if any of that rings true for you, you may be on the brink of something divine. So, you know, this... It, it it just goes on and on that this book is reinforcing, you know, that faithfulness because I, I have tried to stay faithful to the vision. And um, even though, you know, it's tough with all these years. And that was, like I said, that's one of the themes he, he just uh, spit out here is wait, you've got to wait because I, I know I'll mess it up if I go without God. So I have to wait for him and do what I can, and I have a good idea of what I need to do during this process. And you know, this that's what I'm getting out of this book. Yeah, maybe this will help you. We um, are relaunching our Hispanic ministry here in Nuevo. So this is our third go. We planted, we planted two Hispanic churches. One of them um, uh, is was thriving, and then they decided to move and separate from Nuevo, so they, they re relocated to Paris. They're still meeting. Uh, then we started another one, and that one had a shorter life. It kind of um, grew to about 80 people and then went back to about 20 or 30, and we decided to put it to rest, and so we're, we're starting another one. And uh, the guy that I have um, in mind to do the initial work, uh, we sat down and talked, and he wanted to start a church. He wanted to start services. Um, and so in the beginning of January, he actually um, did that. I thought he was starting a group, and what he did was he started a church service. And so I pulled him aside, and I said, we're, we're not doing that yet. We're not, we're not doing church services yet. What I need you to do and what your people need to learn is they need to learn the process of, of actually being disciple makers and making disciples and multiplying both disciples and groups before we actually launch a church because that's how we think it's supposed to work. And so it's that whole model that we talked about with, um, with Blanchard, lead like Jesus is like, okay, let's, let's start here. And part of what I'm looking for from him in this process is if you can multiply disciples and multiply groups, then we can start a church and you can be the pastor. If you can't, it then becomes a question as to whether or not you should be the pastor. So just a little, for me personally, I'm a teacher. And, um, you know, I, I experienced the backwards cycle that we talked about, 25 graduate from seminary, throw you into organizational leadership. And now I'm working my way backwards. Like, oh, you know, when, when did I master this making disciples who make disciples process? Because for me, it's going to church. People come, they listen. Um, if they like me and stay. If the offerings are good and we can raise money to buy property, I'm a good pastor. And that's, that's one part of it, but it's not really the, the basic elementary part of it. And so I'm finding that, that I'm working my way backwards into this matrix and, and it's not healthy and it's not comfortable. So if I sit down and say, Jerry, what do you want to do? And let's just say you want to be a pastor. That's what I would tell you. Number one, you need to start working at, at 
number one, influencing one other person. So I'd ask you, who are you meeting with that you're drawing closer to Christ? And then I would ask you over time, um, who is that person meeting with? Are you training him to do what you're doing with him? Is it duplicatable? And then over that course of time, I'd say, well, Jerry, you know, you put together a group of, of 10 guys, and now those 10 guys are actually meeting with other people, and you've got three other groups that have come out of that. I'd say, wow, you're, you're doing the work of the ministry. And at that point, um, you know, you're, you're actually able to say, we can kind of move forward in this and, and actually begin a church at some point. Um, and, and that would be how that would work. So I would encourage you, number one, to meet with somebody that you're making a disciple out of. Number two, I would, I would find a coach or a mentor that would walk through this process with you and say, here's your vision, and let's talk about the elements of that vision and challenge you in that way. So basically what I'm telling you is you need mentors up and down and that becomes the pastoral model that you begin to use. That's the foundation for everything else. And it's the launch pad for any teaching that you might do out of that. So I've spent the time gathering information and that's great. I love that. That's, that's kind of my passion. Um, and now you need to gather the time of that in experiential, influential, hands-on multiplication of disciples because that's the that's the great commission and then out of that grows out of that grows the church out of that grows your position as a leader you demonstrate it out of your experience our our standard model is i want jerry to get all the information go through the right classes once he does that he's ready to be a pastor and that's only one leg so the other leg is this experiential hands-on influential leadership you know, you can use all those terms. Discipleship is leadership. It's exercising leadership in the context of the church to make people like Christ. So I think that would be that, that how I would, I would you know, help you to put feet on your, on your vision, is that would be the next step. So you're not just waiting for, for, I mean, you're waiting for opportunities, but you're actually implementing the basic principles or those basic activities. That's what you can control along the way as you're waiting. And that really actually opens the door to opportunity. All right, Paul, bring us home with chapter four. So the God of how is the title of that. What God originates, he orchestrates. Did we skip chapter three? No, we didn't. That was Jerry's. Oh. <laughs> Did you want to say something okay, about chapter uh, three? Well, you know, um, actually, yeah, I had a lot, um, a lot to just to add. Um, you know, if I could actually go um, to the end of two, um, when you guys were talking about the opportunities, and you were just talking with Jerry about the opportunities that present themselves, um, you know, about the getting ready part. Um, you know, I think subconsciously, when God does put that task on our heart, uh, even subconsciously as we pray, um, we're moving towards that task, uh, whether we know it or not, and if that's really the drive of our heart. Um, when I'm reading this chapter, uh, this man basically, he just described me to a T, like uh, what we're doing is we're just being still. Um, you, you talk about being still yet being active. Uh, you know, we form our small groups here at PCC and we're trying to organize and disciple people and leaders for the future and hence we're making those preparations um you know at times i guess for you know a layman or someone you know just starting out it maybe it could be discouraging when you're not seeing um the results right away uh when you know these huge opportunities i guess uh you know they're not presenting themselves right away that could be discouraging to people but um, I think through the prayer, through the, sorry, through the prayer and uh, through being still and just trusting in the scripture and his timing, um, what we're realizing is that those opportunities actually do fall into our and fall into our lap if we open our eyes to them. Um, like again, uh, God just put this on my heart about a year or two to to do the ministry uh, about two years ago, and you know here we are, we're leading groups of forty people or more sometimes, and. You know, 
it, again, it just started with a vision, if you will. It just started with a, a dream of a couple other people. And, and now we're putting that into practice. Um, I think it's important. Uh, I, this chapter really hit me because uh, I drive an Impala. <laughs> you know, it talks about this guy is... Um, he downplays his life and I'm just going to drive this clunker around. I'm like, wait a minute. I love my Impala, <laughs> you know? Um, anyway, so this, I mean, it just has a little, you know, little details about it to where you can actually relate it to your life to where um, I think we're all just kind of planning and waiting and being still and waiting for his move. Um, and again, it's important that, you know, he's, he's going to determine when we're ready and what we're ready for. And I think it's it's important that we just you know, stay calm to that. Anyway, I just wanted to add to that. I really liked that chapter, chapter two. Um, and in full honesty, I didn't even get into chapter four. I read to the end of chapter three. I didn't even, I didn't know I was supposed to. Oh, the truth comes out. Yeah, so that's my confession. <laughs> I read to the end of chapter three. Um, so I didn't even get the four. But um, to add, if I could, um, on chapter three, uh, let me see. I, I did write... A bunch of notes. If I could just share one with you. Um, uh, let's see here. Um, he was perfectly positioned. He had no ideas. His years of serving to the king had any divine significance. Uh, he knew all too well the possibility of betrayal from within the inner circle. I just, I just uh, niche little notes um, to where you know. Ever since I was a child, I've always, uh, I've always worked for the church in one capacity or another. Uh, whether it be even cleaning a toilet, you guys, to doing yard work, to doing uh, odd jobs uh, for the elderly, um, you name it. I mean, we started small, and and, uh, and you know, here 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 you find yourself. You know, you're you're helping lead groups now. Now you're you're putting those lessons into practice. Uh, you know, all those things, all those empty pamphlets you found on the floor that. I took, I took time to read and, you know, and I could share that with someone and you can minister to someone. Um, every step, every step that God gives us, every position that he gives us, I think has meaning. Um, just like in, in the job that I have now, I train all my employees to know every position on my floor so that when I step away, they can kind of act as me while I'm away. Um, I think the same goes for ministry. Um, you know, you find yourself filling in for Brother Ryan who has to work or, you know, Brother Greg sick tonight. Can you, you know, facilitate for us? Um, we're not asking a lot, but, you know, if you can fill in for us, that'd be great. And, you know, you find these positions just coming up. You don't want to take too much into yourself anyway because, you know what, if you just sit back and be still, it's amazing what really just falls into your lap and it's positioning yourself. Um, anyway, I, that's all I really had to share um, because, right. again, I only read to chapter three. I'm sorry, Steve. <laughs> no worries. Uh, just gives you an extra chapter next week to read. So yeah. we'll, Thank we'll, you. we'll hold you accountable to that. <laughs> Amen. Um, all right. Any other comments before I wrap it up for you? All right, so on your screen, hopefully, there is a picture of the visioneering um, projects uh, that you have. Um, so that's on, I posted that on Google Plus, and I also posted uh, what's well, on Google Drive, so you can get it either way, but it's a link to Google Drive. This is basically what's at the end of every chapter. Um, so you may find, and I would encourage you to, to actually walk at least walk through some of the ones that are more pertinent to you but i think they would all be helpful they're they're fairly good but it's a good process i think uh to get into to start um examining um what it is that uh you want to be doing what you need to be doing in response to uh, the need for vision i think it's that important so i'd encourage you to do that uh also just a couple things um, waiting doesn't mean doing nothing. I, I hope that was clear in 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 the re, in the reading. Uh, waiting includes planning, praying, and it also includes faithfulness. So part of I think the process that God has for us is that when we're faithful in what He puts in our plate and on our plate that's right in front of us, uh, that really is. Uh, the pool of opportunity, interestingly enough. 
You know, he says, pray for opportunities. And when you're faithful in what he's actually presently having you do, that's where you want to look for those initial opportunities. Uh, and out of those opportunities, oftentimes comes the, um, the fulfillment of the vision, which I think is why that story, I think it was of the, the high school kid was so powerful, um, that he was faithful. He didn't quite know how it was going to work, but he was faithful. Um, he expressed that faithfulness and God then did the rest. God fulfilled the vision, uh, even though it didn't include him. And that's the other part that's, that's pretty powerful as well, is when you think about vision and when you think about your place in vision, it always comes back to giving God glory. It's not about my own personal empire or accomplishments. Um, I don't want to diminish that. I want to, I want to encourage people. I think people need a sense of purpose and a sense of, of um, people acknowledging their accomplishments. But ultimately, when push comes to shove, we want, we want God to be the one who's glorified through all that we do. So be faithful where you are and implement, uh, begin to implement a vision process into your calendar. I think those are the, the big things that I would leave you with today. All right, any other comments? Zoom good, Zoom bad. Uh, Zoom's good. I just didn't know, Steve, I'm gonna ask a simple guy, lack of computer knowledge. Next week, if you're on Zoom, we don't have to do all that downloading, do we? Or is no. that just, okay. So you okay. should just be able to click onto that uh, little Zoom icon on your computer and then I'll punch in, join a meeting, and then punch in the meeting ID and you're set. Okay, because the pictures are real clear and everything went, I didn't have any glitches over here, so it was good. Paul, it seemed to work out pretty well for you. Is that is that accurate once you got on? You know, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, this isn't my normal interface that I use. Okay. Um, I to try it on my other one, but yeah, this is golden. Love it. Um, would one of you guys touch base with Alex and maybe help him uh, if he was having trouble today get on? Um, hands on, that would be good. Okay. All right. We'll see you next week. All right. See ya. Thank you, Steve. I just don't know how to leave. <laughs>